Now, Deputy Prime Minister Lawrence Wong says Asia already has the ability to navigate multiple storms it faces. He was spoke, speaking at the annual Nikkei Forum on the future of Asia, pointing out that the region's multilateral approach gives countries agency to shape the developments around them. Well, that's even as three global challenges loom. That's big power rivalry, economic protectionism and climate change. Mitch Ishida tells us more. Singapore's Deputy Prime Minister calls the Taiwan Straits the most dangerous flashpoint in the region. It has the potential to drag Asia into any big power confrontation the U.S. and China may have. Lawrence Wang says ASEAN has responded by cooperating more on defense and security and not just among the member countries of the Southeast Asian regional bloc. Leaders met regularly with major powers outside the region as well, such as the U.S., China, Japan and India. We engage with all the major powers and we avoid exclusive commitments with any single party. During the Cold War, many developing countries maintained their neutrality as part of a non-aligned movement. ASEAN's approach today is not so much passive non-alignment, but more about active multi-engagement. We work to bring all the key players together, strive to find common ground, and advance cooperation to promote regional peace and stability. ASEAN is taking similar steps on the economic front as well. That's as the globalization of the last three decades threatens to give way to a more fragmented global economy. Mr. Wang Moore's competing regional blocs will make it harder for Asia's developing countries to sit at the same table as more advanced nations. To try to prevent this, ASEAN is actively engaging its long-standing partners like the U.S. and European Union. It's also building new ties in regions such as Africa, the Middle East and Latin America. These diverse arrangements form a dense mesh of cooperation and interdependence, as well as interlocking circles of partnerships between the region and our external partners. And this gives all of our partners concrete stakes in Asia's peace and prosperity, and we believe this makes for a more stable and balanced region. And Japan can have a stake too. Mr. Wang says as a leader in green technology, Japan can play a key role in facilitating sustainability financing and projects in Southeast Asia. In fact, on Wednesday, he visited Japanese companies working on a hydrogen supply chain network. Mr. Wang also welcomes Japan's intention to cooperate more in regional security. Japan has historically adopted a low-key posture in security. But with the passage of time, there is scope for Japan to make a greater contribution in this area. We hope that Japan will continue to build on the momentum of its recent engagements with regional countries and further contribute to Asia's stability, security and growth. He concluded there are reasons for optimism in a more dangerous and troubled world. Countries in the region share a deep commitment to collaborate for common interest. With such collective efforts, a successful future is possible. This is also Mr. Wong's first official visit to Japan. On Friday, he is expected to meet Japanese political leaders, including Prime Minister Fumio Kishida, to further strengthen bilateral ties. Michio Ishida, CNA, Tokyo. A DPMOM also touching on local politics at the Nikkei Forum. He says the timing of leadership succession is not decided. When asked during a Q&A session about when he expects to take over the reins, he pointed out that there are competing priorities domestically and abroad. Singapore's general election must be held by 2025. It's just a matter of time. If it happens before the elections, then I will lead the team into the elections and I will ask for a mandate from Singaporeans for me and my team. If it happens after the elections, then it's quite clear the Prime Minister remains as the leader. But I will still play a key role in the campaign 
and we will make very clear to voters what the succession plan is after the elections, assuming, of course, that the PAP wins the confidence and the mandate of Singaporeans to govern. Mr Wong was also asked for his reaction to Singapore's continued emission from a democracy summit organised by the US. The second edition of that event saw more than 120 leaders gather. Mr Wong says Singapore's system of governance is not static and will continue to evolve. But he says this is for Singaporeans to decide. We are comfortable with who we are and we really do not need external parties or external events to validate our status. If you ask, is, does Singapore have the characteristics of other Western liberal democracies? The answer is not, not all. And in fact, we do not blindly copy what others do. We adapt and learn, and we apply and develop a model that is suitable for our own needs, our own circumstances. And that model has worked so, so far.